And thanks for staying with us right now live at 11 from the WHAS 1119 Kentuckiana is under a wind advisory. You can see the flag picking up a little steam there live from our camera. Expect the winds to do some howling tonight. Strong gusty winds will knock things around and make driving tricky. We're getting you ready for the morning. A blustery day before the temperature drops again. And hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us on this Monday night. I'm Doug Prophet. As you can see, the rain's approaching, and meteorologist Colleen Peterson has a new update on the winds at this hour and what to expect overnight. It's pretty warm out there, Colleen. Yeah, pretty warm, and that's not good when we're talking about storms, but thankfully they are going to behave. We are just watching the wind threat separate from the rain, so we are not seeing any threat of severe weather overnight tonight, so we can all sleep easy. However, if you're heading out on the road, maybe if you're a trucker, there is a wind advisory in effect through tomorrow evening. The wind not too bad right now. It's only around 20 to 25, but we could see those wind gusts get up to 30 or 40 overnight tonight as well as through tomorrow. Of course, we're already tracking that rain tracking our way. Uh, big wave of it off to the west. That first wave of a few is just entering Jefferson County as we speak off to the west. Just seeing some light rain. We're not even seeing any lightning with it. We do not have that kind of environment to even see around of thunder with this so light uh, widespread rain good sleeping weather a little bit uh, more moderate around E town and Hodgenville down to Greensburg on that radar so looking at that forecast model we're going to see continuous rainfall really from now until four o'clock then we'll start to clear out pretty dry through tomorrow but then we could see an isolated thunderstorm tomorrow afternoon and that is when we have a low chance of seeing something strong out there I'll break down all those impacts for your night and day Ahead coming up. Doug. Thank you, Colleen. Now the big story tonight on the night team. Tomorrow night at this time, we will know the outcome. The results of a major JCPS vote that will change the way they have taken kids to and from school for decades. It comes after details of a special audit were released today, looking at the transportation disaster from the first day of school. WHS 1119's Alex Dieter and photojournalist Addie Hill have reaction to that audit. The first day of school tainted by a JCPS transportation meltdown. Now a 248 page audit breaks down the question on everyone's mind. What went so wrong? There are a million things that led to the debacle that happened on the first day of school. The report found that JCPS was not prepared when it tried to implement three things. A new school choice system, a new nine bell system, and new bus routes designed by a company called Alpha Route. JCPS suggested 10 seconds for each student loading and unloading. Alpha Route cut it to five seconds. JCPS suggested no student ride more than 60 minutes. Alpha Route changed it to 70 minutes for non-magnet and 90 minutes for magnet schools. The tardiness in our buses has been the number of drivers. JCPS Board of Education member James Craig claims the problems we're watching unfold are caused by a shortage in bus drivers. Going forward, we have to reduce the total number of riders that we have inside of the system. The board is now preparing to cast their votes to decide. Will the first day of school this year look the same as the last? Decisions will be made Tuesday night here at the Van Hoos Education Center as the JCPS Board of Education votes on how to transport students to school the following school year. Superintendent Marty Polio is recommending option one, which would cut all transportation for magnet and traditional school students. We have to eliminate about 10,000 kids from the system in order to get the kids who are participating in the transportation system to and from school on time. Um, I anticipate that the superintendent's recommendation will likely Pass. A recommendation that is unacceptable, especially in West Louisville. That has gained vocal opposition from parents, the NAACP, and former councilwoman Mary Woolridge. You know, that would deny children and parents the opportunity to have a high quality education for African Americans and brown and, and poor people. While JCPS calls this option the most equitable option with the least negative impact on students of color. We simply do not have the human resources though available to us in order to ensure transportation for every single student who wants one. It would be an historic change for the school district. In Louisville, Alex Dieterer, the WHS 1119 team on your side. By the way, in a statement, we asked JCPS spokesperson telling us the district is no longer using Alpha Route.
Instead, they have hired six employees whose job is to establish transportation routes for next school year, all in-house employees. Now tonight, uh, we now know who police believe caused the crash that made national news over the Ohio River in Louisville. One man is now facing several charges for his driving that day at noon that police say left this semi truck dangling right over the side of the Clark Memorial Bridge. 33 year old Trevor Branham of Jeffersonville, Indiana, is charged with wanton endangerment and operating a vehicle with a suspended license. WHS 11 night team's Taylor Woods has been taking a closer look at Branham's critical uh, criminal record here and you find that it does go back several years, Taylor. That's right. And uh, uh, Trevor Branham, he has a history of traffic violations and he was just charged for driving on a suspended license in February in Clark County just days before the second street crash. And according to a police report, he put himself and other motorists lives in danger on March 1st. A semi tractor trailer is hanging over the bridge. If we need people right now, keep it okay. Just 24 days after a Cisco semi truck was left dangling off the side of the 2nd Street Bridge on Friday, 33 year old Trevor Branham of Jeffersonville, Indiana was charged for the four vehicle accident. He faces four counts of wanton endangerment and one count of operating a motor vehicle with a suspended license. You see this, and you realize how many people could have died as a result of this faulty car. That was earlier this month. We talked with Glenna Hess. It was her electric vehicle that stalled on the bridge moments before the crash. You can see Hess's electric car circled near the railing. According to a police report, witnesses say Branham was speeding in a Chevrolet C1500 truck while weaving in and out of traffic. That's when he hit the stalled electric vehicle. Police say he then lost control of his truck, striking the Cisco semi. Hess remembered the crash in our earlier interview. I saw a blue uh, pickup truck with a badly injured person in front of me and I look behind and then I see the semi. But this isn't the first time Trevor Branham has been charged with a suspended license. He was charged in Clark County on February 19th for driving with a suspended license. He then paid that ticket violation on March 4th. Three years before that in 2021, he was charged with speeding. Branham has a lengthy track record of traffic violations dating all the way back to 2008. Records show over those years he served little to no jail time at all. And Trevor Branham, he posted a percentage of his $20,000 bond and is now out of jail. And he is set to appear back in court on May 15th. In studio, Taylor Woods, WHAS 11 night team on your side. Taylor, thank you. You'll soon have the opportunity to weigh in on that federal consent decree that will shape reforms within Metro government and Louisville Metro Police. The U.S. Department of Justice has scheduled two community meetings, one in person and one virtually for the month of April. The team who conducted the DOJ investigation will be here to share what consent decrees have done for other cities and what they can do in Louisville. Right now, the DOJ and city leaders are negotiating the terms of that consent decree. The first meeting, keep in mind, is going to be held Monday, April 8th from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at the Republic Bank Foundation YMCA on West Broadway. Then the virtual meeting will be held April 16th. The DOJ says they plan to have other events in different parts of the city in the coming months. Happening news tonight, taking a stand against youth violence. According to the city's gun violence dashboard, people ages 18 to 24 make up more than 36% of homicides in the metro. Tonight, the Metro Youth Cabinet launched National Youth Violence Prevention Week with a vendor fair at Metro United Way. WHS 1119 photojournalist Elijah McKenzie shows us how they're working to make a difference. This is the fourth event for National Youth Violence Prevention Week. It is the vendor fair at Metro United Way where we are bringing 60 youth service organizations and the like here to Metro United Way so young people and families can come see what programs and services are near them. Yeah, so that's why I'm at because I, I teach at Central now. So we started 10 years ago at the tragic death of my cousin. We are there to really positively impact the families and children of those who have been impacted by gun violence. Give them some kind of outlet, something that they can do, whether it's arts and crafts, cooking classes, any of those things to keep them busy and active and to develop life skills is really what we're all about. So this event right here that you guys are all out is something that we put on and we look forward to continuing. Thank you again and continue the network. Our 
Girls Empowerment Camp introduces girls to the many jobs that are available in the fire service. So we use the camp to demonstrate all the different work that goes on at the fire department, but at the same time, we're teaching them fire and life safety skills. How you feeling? Good? All right, I'm glad y'all heard, bro. We figure out a way to reach the youth so that we can put a dent into this gun violence. What's up, man? What up, fam? It's very important that we reach out, we do our part. So what we have in a lot of cities here in America is youth disconnectedness. We have a lot of young people that are disconnected from their communities, from their neighbors. So events like this really gets our young people more connected uh, and feeling more like a community. And with that, different events are planned each night this week. For the full visit, go to our website. We've got them posted at whs11.com. Right now, all new on the WHS 11 night team, just months after a local vote required a Clifton Heights bar to give up its liquor license, that bar, that business, is now closed. A manager for Virtue Bar and Lounge confirmed the news to WHS 11. We went by tonight and found a sign outside saying the building is now available. In November, people living around the bar on Brownsboro Road and uh, Lower Clifton Heights voted to make their precinct dry. Some neighbors blamed the bar for trash, increased traffic and violence. The owner previously told us he did his best to address the concerns, but it wasn't enough to sway that vote. Also happening tonight, UK coach John Calipari says he will be meeting with his boss, the UK athletic director, Mitch Barnhart, sometime tomorrow. It comes as the storm has grown since last week. Would Calipari hold on to his longtime job after losing to Oakland in game one of the NCAA tournament? WHS 11 sports director Ken Spencer is here with Calipari's first comments. And uh, Kent, did he sound like a coach losing his job? No, not at all. He definitely spoke with an eye to the future. John Calipari says, like you just did, Doug, he hadn't met with Mitch Barnhart yet for their end-of-year meeting, but it will probably take place tomorrow. Calipari said the standard at Kentucky is national championships. His standard is competing for national championships. Kentucky hasn't been past the first weekend in the NCAA tournament since 2019 when they made it to the Elite Eight. They haven't been to a Final Four since 2015. He sounded like somebody motivated to get back to that stage. I'm not changing. 24-7, let's go. Uh, whether it's recruiting, all the stuff that we've got to do. That is a commitment that I give to the fans that I haven't changed. This is a this is the this is like wearing a coat. It never goes away. But I love it. This is what I want. This is what I wanted. This is why I never left. This is it. And now it's let's come together and let's go do something. Let's do something special. And we can do it. We've done it. Let's do it again. And as you could just hear, he sounded like somebody very much motivated. When it comes to his meeting with Mitch Barnhart, he looks forward to hearing what he has to say and any suggestions he may have. Now, you listened to the whole show, which went, went on pretty long, and I'm, I want to pick up on what he said there. I'm not changing. Well, the fans are demanding that. Is Calipari changing any well, of his philosophies? To, when it comes to not changing, he, he says about his work ethic. Now, when it comes gotcha. to changing philosophies, you know, he said something I thought was really interesting. In the past, if he had a, a young man who was going to be a top draft pick, he would say, you're not allowed to come back. I've taken your scholarship away. You've got to go and get that money and change your family's future. Tonight, he said, if somebody comes to him and says he, they want to come back, he's going to tell them this. They play a game in eight months. <laughs> so he's going to allow them to do so, which is a, a complete changing of the guard for him. Probably the most listened to coaches show in the country in many years. I tonight. would imagine. All right. Thank you, Kent. Come